Hey guys, welcome back to Sila's Social Studies. Hey, it's Sila's Social Studies. All right, so today we're going to be covering the Jacksonian democracy and, and who is Jacksonian and what's his democracy. Well, this is going to be covering the presidency of Andrew Jackson from about 1828 to 1836 or 1829 to 1837, however you want to call it. You want to call it by the day they were voted in or the day that they actually took office. All right, so Andrew Jackson and the Jacksonian democracy, what do we know about it? Well, if you remember when we went over the uh, War of 1812, we we're talking about right prior to Thomas Jefferson uh, put into effect the uh, Embargo Act in 1807 and the Non-Intercourse Act, and that really cut off trade with Britain and France. And then the Non-Intercourse Act was like, well, okay, everybody will be able to trade with but Britain and France. It really didn't do anything to Britain and France. But either way, Part of the uh, result of, the, uh, of those two acts is that Americans started to realize that they were dependent too heavy on foreign goods. And this really had an effect in the United States, right? Because really part of the Jacksonian democracy is going on with part of the Industrial Revolution. So America is changing fast. The American economy is changing fast in the early 1800s. By this time, uh, the cotton gin's invented. Uh, you know, cotton is really exploding. The textile industry is exploding. I mean, it's really, really doing a lot here. So in the North, you have these large-scale factories now that are replacing, you know, small family-owned uh, workshops or, or town-owned workshops. Now you have these huge factory with these huge machines, uh, you know, using, you know, this type of... Uh, uh, steam power or water power, right? And small family farms in the South are now giving way to more of large plantation owners. So what does that mean? So now you have more of a uneven distribution of wealth. The wealth is being more concentrated uh, among the northern merchants, the business owners, and the southern plantation owners. It is no longer spread throughout uh, you know, the small farmers or the small tradesmen, the bartering, the trading, the selling. So what does this do to ordinary Americans, right? Ordinary Americans believe that the wealthy are tightening their grip and their control on the government. Whoa. That sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? Hey, listen, we're not going to lie. We're not going to try to, you know, you know, put a blanket on it and forget it never happened. Does the wealthy kind of run Washington, D.C.? Truth of the matter is, yes, the wealthy still do control Washington, D.C. Think about the forming of our government. Washington, yeah, he was wealthy. Him and Martha Washington were wealthy. They had a, a, a plantation. Uh, let's see, Jefferson, yeah, he was wealthy. He owned a plantation. Madison, yup, yup, wealthy plantation owner. John Adams, let's see, no, he could, oh, no, no, he wasn't a plantation owner, but he was a successful lawyer in the New England colonies or, or the New England area. Uh, you remember John Adams, he was the lawyer who... Um, who got those uh, British soldiers, uh, you know, whatever, seven out of the nine, they were, they got off free from the Boston Massacre. And the other two got like a, you know, like a burn on their thumb, ooh, right? So yes, the government has always been controlled by the wealthy. And so far today, and, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, it seems like the wealthy will be controlling our government. So why does Andrew Jackson and this Jacksonian democracy matter? Well, people saw Andrew Jackson as something different. And these small farmers, these frontier settlers, slaveholders, they really backed Jackson. They believed that he would be the man to defend his rights or, or defend the rights of the common people. And he would be now, he would become what we call today the president of the common man. Now, what makes him the president of the common man is what happens during this democracy. Like I mentioned, this is the Democratic Party of today. This is what they trace their lineage back to right here. So uh, during the 1820s, uh, political parties are holding nominating conventions, which is allowing party members, not just the leaders, to select the candidates. So now you have more and more people selecting. And this democracy spread in the early 1800s more people became involved in politics. Why? Because Martin Van Buren, one of Andrew Jackson's like really good buddies, hey buddy, thanks a lot for helping me out. He actually got a lot of these states to lower or eliminate the property ownership requirement for men to be able to vote. Now you remember, right? Uh, the people who ran this country, rich, white, landowning dudes, 
those four things. Who are the people who could vote? Rich, white, land-owning dudes. Well, now you've kind of gotten rid of that. So that makes your voting populace a lot bigger than just the wealthy elite landowning voting for president. Now, how does this help? That means more common men are able to vote because um, there's more common people than there were wealthy people and they were able to vote and they were able to steer this presidency into their direction. So this democratic reform made voting reform possible. This suffrage rights or voting rights were now available for, for, for more uh, white men. And again, the period of this time of the 20s and the 30s, this is what we call the Jacksonian democracy. Now, who is he running against, right? He's running against John Quincy Adams. People saw uh, um, of Andrew Jackson as a blue collar worker. He was a guy who worked his way up through the army, became a general. He was in like 20 something duels. They called him old hickory. You couldn't really, you know, you know, bother the guy at all. He was killing people. He was a manly man. So you had Andrew Jackson, common man, against John Quincy Adams, son of President John Adams, a Harvard graduate, a hoity-toity guy. And most Americans didn't really favor that. Uh, Andrew Jackson picks this crazy guy right here, John C. Calhoun, as his vice president, and they will butt heads pretty good, uh, and we'll see in the next uh, section here. But again, Jackson's portrayed as this war hero. He picks a Southerner, John C. Calhoun, as his running mate. Um, you know, John Quincy Adams, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, and Americans didn't like that. Jackson is able to easily uh, defeat uh, John Quincy Adams with the popular vote. And how does Andrew Jackson start running his presidency? Supporters uh, saw Jackson as a, a victory for the common man. The common man now have a say in our government. Uh, Jackson would reward his political backers, people who helped him with jobs in the government. And he would call this a spoil system, right? To the victor belong the spoils of the enemy. Hey, you help me, I'll help you. All right. So that's what Andrew Jackson does. He helps his um, his followers, his people who helped him, like Martin Van Buren right there, one of his closest advisors. He was his strongest ally and a member of his kitchen cabinet. And the kitchen cabinet was the the group that Jackson relied heavily on. And it was just a group of close advisors that, uh, that would sometimes meet in the White House kitchen to discuss important things uh, in the government. So a couple of things you need to remember. Uh, the Democratic Party of today, traced back to Andrew Jackson, again, president uh, of the common man, this voter reform made it so that you know you didn't need so much land anymore or, or, or any land at all to be able to vote uh, and this really propels jackson uh to the presidency we're going to cover jackson in the banks next and you'll see where he butts heads with john c calhoun